Good afternoon. The Council for Anti-Aging is meeting has now come to order. Um, would you all please uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance for me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Francine, would you please call the roll? <coughs> Commissioner Borgie? Here. Commissioner Dukoski? Here. Commissioner Cam? Here. Commissioner Norkin? Here. Commissioner Poprock? Here. Commissioner Shentes? Commissioner Searden? Here. Commissioner Silverberg? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we have our speaker, I'd like to make a few remarks and welcome everybody once again to another broadcast of your Council on Aging. Today's broadcast will feature Ed Lupton of Discovery Living, who has had many years in disaster planning and preparation. It seemed that almost every part of the world had been the victim of a natural disaster, be it hurricane or typhoon, tornado or cyclone, tsunami or earthquake or any of the myriad forms that make for a disaster. Planning for such an emergency and then carrying out a plan to ensure your own safety is something we talk a lot about but don't do much about. After listening to Ed, you may change your mind. And now I'll turn the meeting to Jim, who will introduce our speaker. Yes. Yeah, you need to call for public comments. I'm sorry. Um, public comments. Uh, there are none, so uh, we'll go on to the speaker. Thank you, Harry. Our speaker, Ed Lupton, is the founder of the Primary Foundation, which is a nonprofit whose major mission is uh, disaster planning for people with disabilities and aid to the elderly in daily living and in times of crisis. Now, Ed has traveled the, the country, actually, and had a lot of conversations with a lot of communities. And from what I understand, came to the conclusion that many of these communities did not have a good planning, disaster planning program in place, and particularly for those who are, who are in jeopardy, those who are disabled, those who are fragile. So Ed has done a great deal of work in this regard over the years, and in addition to founding the Primary Foundation, he also uh, started the Facilities 9-11 Coalition, which was a gathering of, of resource information for all the public services that might be available. Ed, welcome. Tell us how we can do better. Very good. Thank you for having me. Uh, first, I, I should say that uh, I can remember as a as a boy growing up in the area, driving by this particular location when it was the wild animal park and jungle land, and here we are evolved. Actually, this is the first time I've been in this uh, in this center area, and it's really beautiful. It's an unbelievable project. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I moved back from Sacramento to this area, and. Uh, Currently, I'm involved in a two-year project with the California Department of Social Services working with uh, Ventura County and also Los Angeles County in developing an annex to better shelter people with disabilities in the elderly. As you may or may not know, uh, the American Red Cross is limited in their ability to meet the medical needs of someone entering a shelter during a crisis, and uh, as a result, uh, as we experienced in the hurricanes uh, a few years ago, a lot of people were moved into licensed facilities and hospital settings as a result of the shelter's inability to meet their care and supervision needs. So uh, what the concept at this point is now is to develop these FAST teams, functional assessment and support team members that will assist in the shelter to better accommodate people uh, with disabilities and also the elderly so that a greater cross-section of the population is hopefully going to be 
uh, able to be cared for in the shelter, and those that are not then would be uh, transported to an appropriate setting, whether it be a facility or a hospital setting. Uh, so that that this project is currently going on. It's supposed to finish uh, mid-year next year, and again, it's it's in a conceptual stage. We're developing the annex uh, annexes for the two counties, and uh, after that, uh, the training uh, curriculum has to be developed. So it's years away before it's going to be fully optional. At least the state is moving in a direction where it's recognizing the needs of uh, the elderly and people with disabilities. So I was happy to uh, be in a position to be asked to be involved in this project here uh, last year. Uh, this other uh, project that I'm involved in, the Facility 911 Coalition, uh, uh, is a pet project of mine. I come from a background of elder care, about 20 years of elder care experience. I owned and operated a six bed and also a 48 bed uh, assisted living facility in Northern California. And I'll tell you the story about that, uh, which got me started with all this in a minute. But uh, uh, I have this belief that uh, facilities, even though they are required by the regulations to have a written mass casualty plan of action, really haven't woken up to the realization of what happens when they get that call to a mandatory evacuation call, that they know they're going to be living, leaving the facility. And when you're moving numbers of people at one time, for me it was I had to evacuate 48 people, uh, and the evacuation was an extended evacuation. That is a monumental task, and there are a lot of ramifications that are the result of proper planning or lack of proper planning. Uh, so the Facility 911 Coalition is uh, an offshoot of my involvement since uh, I had to evacuate these people in 1997. I was asked by the State of California uh, in the aftermath of that evacuation due to the fact that I kept standing up at these emergency services meetings and voicing my concern over the lack of planning of facilities, the county and also the state, and this evacuation that involved two counties, that we weren't ready. And so the state of California Community Care Licensing asked if I was interested in uh, teaching a course for facilities. And I elected to do that, and I'll tell you the reason why here in a few minutes. And I traveled the state of California teaching a four-hour continuing education course to administrators and staff of licensed facilities throughout the state. I also wrote emergency plans uh, for about a third of the regional centers that work with the developmentally disabled. Uh, here locally, I'm going to be uh, giving administrators two hour uh, a refresher course in emergency planning for their facilities here in the next uh, six months, going all the way up to, uh, I guess, San Luis Obispo, uh, involving the Tri County Regional Center. I've given similar ones here in the last few months uh, in Los Angeles. And the idea is to get the facilities up to speed. The coalition is to create a network so that facilities have a place that they can go to for information. You know, I will be giving them information through a newsletter. Uh, this manual here is a series of manuals that I wrote for facilities. Actually, the facility. Uh, Emergency plan was over 100 pages at one time, and I've condensed it down to uh, 39 pages of quick reference, checklists, and forms, uh, an Ill illness in injury prevention program, staff training. Also, facilities need to uh, uh, tr uh, train their families so that uh, in the event of a major crisis that uh, they're able to uh, uh, stay with uh, their their duties there at the facility and at the same time know that their families are are doing the right things as far as uh, uh, protecting their their lives in, in the crisis situation because you can't do what happened in uh, New Orleans you can't just up and leave people unattended in a facility because it results in wrongful death and prosecution so uh, they, these facilities are going to receive, you know, a, a lot of different benefits through this coalition, and that's my personal crusade. My project is to move these licensed facilities into a higher level of uh, of uh, readiness. 
Uh, now, getting back to how this all started, uh, as I alluded before, the regulations say every facility is supposed to have a, as, have to have a, a written mass casualty plan of action. Uh, we did. Our 48-bed facility did have this, uh, this, uh, this plan, but uh, like anything else, out of sight, out of mind, you never look at something that uh, uh, you think is not going to happen. You read about these things in a newspaper, but you never believe that you're going to get this call telling you that, I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave this facility because you're in danger of losing your life and everybody in the facility within the next few hours. So that happened to me, and uh, they would say it was not a good experience. Uh, January 1st, uh, what was happening, uh, the water in the Lake Oroville Dam was soon to go over the spillway. It had rained 84 out of 87 days prior to January 1st that year. So the ground was saturated, the river was flowing, the dams were full, and uh, we had a lot of water runoff due to this last storm. So the water was in danger of going over the spillway, even though they were letting as much water out of that dam as they could. So in the event it would go over the spillway, it was going to flood you know, the adjoining valley, which meant uh, you and Sutter counties were going to flood big time. So they evacuated both counties. And you can imagine you know, the impact of people in two entire counties evacuating. And that's why what, what I tell people in my course uh, is that you really need to think on a larger scale, the scales that you read about on the front page in the newspapers, that what, what happens if it's earthquake, flood, fires, or whatever, we're moving hundreds of thousands of people at one time, what is going to be the impact on that? Whether you're going to be able to evacuate or whether you're going to have to shelter in place, are you ready? So the, the important thing is to think big. Uh, we evacuated uh, for a little over a week. Uh, I got everybody out. We, uh, it actually took a lot longer than we anticipated uh, because moving elderly people is not a quick uh, situation and not a quick operation. So I tell the elderly that uh, you really need to be proactive in your approach to emergency planning and not reactive because if you take this reactive approach, you're going to spin your wheels, spin your wheels, just say, what do I do now? And uh, you're going to waste a lot of uh, time that could be a you know, life-saving situation. So if you're proactive, you would have already set up your emergency plan. Uh, you would have the necessary documents and know what you're supposed to do so that uh, you can move out of the danger zone in a, uh, in a, in a uh, very uh, prompt period. Uh, my daughter had to do that during the Malibu fires recently. She called me at 515, said, hey, I got this knock on the door, I gotta leave. And so I said, well, don't mess around you leave. And so uh, she was one of the first uh, people off uh, down the street because uh, uh, I, I told her, get, get your important things, get out. And two houses up from her, you know, the house burned down. So you don't want to run into a situation you, where you, you don't know what you're doing and, and you're slow and, uh, and then something bad happens. So uh, getting back to my crisis, uh, uh, we, everyone in our, in our facility survived that crisis. Uh, they were moved to Beale Air Force Base in three different bus loads. And uh, I was in the third bus load of people and due to the enormity of the evacuation, uh, our third bus uh, was stopped right in front of the gates to the Air Force Base and we were directed up to a school up in the foothills. The reason for that was uh, uh, again, the size of the evacuation uh, caused the county to run out of shelters. And so they, uh, they used a school cafeteria up in the foothills there as a uh, shelter uh, to shelter uh, uh, different people from facilities. And uh, there were other elderly in there as well. So we had 200 people in a shelter uh, uh, that originally had no beds. They were able to get mattresses off of uh, the, the beds at, at the local jail and put them on the floor of the cafeteria. And uh, so we had 200 people in that uh, area sleeping on a mattress on the floor for a week. And uh, so it was not a good situation. And we also only had three toilets. So uh, the element of privacy was, was not there. And I don't know if any of you here on the panel have ever you know, experienced uh, living in a shelter overnight. Uh, it can be really good, uh, it can be not so good, but 
in any event, living in a shelter is not the same as your home, okay? So this gets back to the pre-planning you know, uh, that I'm going to get into. You, know, you should have a relocation, relocation site that you can go to to avoid you know, having to uh, spend uh, your uh, time in a shelter. It, it, you may not have an alternative, but uh, you want an alternative, hopefully, other than a shelter uh, to avoid the, the trauma of, uh, of that experience. You want to go to what I tell facility to a like environment, you know, uh, an environment like you left at, at your home. And again, that takes some uh, planning. So uh, we survived the week. Uh, at the end of the week, we got uh, a call to go back and everything was fine. Everybody was happy to go back. And I thought it was over. I thought the evacuation was over, but it was only beginning for me at that time. Yes, uh, the dam did not uh, go over and uh, there was major water in the rivers and uh, the levee did break below us by about three or four miles. One facility uh, uh, waited to the last second to evacuate and as a result uh, did not get their clothing, their medication and records. So you can imagine trying to monitor people for a week without those important items. Then, uh, you know, people were running for their lives, or a couple people lost their lives because of the onrush of the water when the, when the levee ro broke, because, again, they did not heed the mandatory evacuation call. And, you know, it's an option for the person whether they want to do that or not. Uh, but when we got back, uh, you know, uh, the water company said the water was good, and, of course, uh, as soon as uh, uh, my residents started drinking the water, uh, you know, I had an outbreak of diarrhea. You know, and, and that's because elderly people, uh, uh, due to medication, etc., you know, their immune systems are not as strong as someone 20, 30, 40 years younger than them. So they're more prone to pick up, you know, some bacteria in the water and, and have a reaction to that. So I ended up boiling water for two weeks, even though they said the water was fine. Uh, but that wasn't the big problem. The big problem was uh, two weeks after we were back, uh, one of my residents uh, uh, got the, her health just went straight down. She was a mental health person, and I found out that she stayed the week uh, on, a, on a canvas cot that had a low center of gravity, and it was hard for her to get in and out of the cot other than to go to the bathroom and uh, to to eat. And... Uh, so uh, I saw her during that time because I was, you know, covering my people in three different locations, and she always said she was fine, but she really wasn't fine. She was hallucinating. The trauma of the event was getting to her, and within two weeks, I had to put her uh, into a 911 call and put her in the hospital, and she died in the hospital three days later. And the man up in the school who was a, a stroke vic victim, paralyzed on one side, uh, uh, he was incontinent, agitated. He was, you know, just a crusty old man, and uh, liked him a lot. Uh, I had to put him in a skilled nursing facility. Within three weeks, he was dead. Within six weeks, all told, within the 12 months following that crisis, that major crisis, uh, we lost 17 of our 48 people. Not all of them. You know, a few of them passed away, but it was the deter deteriorating health that was the impact. Okay. And this is a statistic that no one really follows. They talk about trauma, transfer trauma. I call it transfer trauma. That's, that's the key word, transfer trauma. And as it relates to the elderly, you know, the elderly are in a stage of life where they don't have the time to recover, okay? So that if things happen to them, then it's going to have a greater impact on them. And news say I didn't realize the impact was was going to be so severe until I saw the changes in their health uh, when they came back. And losing uh, 17 people at a, uh, roughly a little over one-third of your, your census of the people under your care is a tremendous impact uh, on the facility and the lives of those individuals. And I always felt that uh, had we been better prepared, had the county been better prepared, and even the, and the state better prepared, maybe we could have saved some of those lives, okay? So that's what got me started, okay? And I've been at this ever since, as I said, teaching courses and uh, putting this coalition together and uh, seeing what I can do. So 
I, you know, I welcome the opportunity to talk to this group here and, uh, and hopefully uh, shed a, a few words of insight as to uh, what uh, you should or should not be doing. As I said before, two things. One, you need to be proactive and not reactive. That means you should start thinking about your own emergency plan of action now. And the other, the other point is your plan should be on a major scale, not on a minor scale. It's not, if something happens to my home, what's going to happen? Well, you, you'll just maybe move down the street to a motel or to a friend's house or whatever. But I want you to think big as to what is going to happen if I have to leave uh, Ventura County and go somewhere else. And as the hurricane people in, in the south, they're actually uh, moving to out of state because all the hotels and motels were filled to capacity. And to find a room, uh, they had to go out of state. Okay, and you know what happened with that? You know the the major traffic tra problems uh, that ensued with all these thousands of people trying to evacuate at, at the same time. And you can foresee what would happen here on 101 or uh, 23 oh, uh, with uh, a mandatory evacuation call for the area. It would be slow. It would be slow in evolving, and maybe it wouldn't evolve for a while. So, uh, so what can you do now? Okay, uh, one of my concerns is elderly who uh, spend a lot of time in their homes and are not moving about in the community, and as such, they don't interact. They don't have a lot of support. So there is an element of the senior community that is really going to be press for alternatives because they have not taken the time to get their own support group, okay, uh, so that in the event of a crisis, they can call on people to assist them in their own personal care and maybe to come and uh, move them out of a danger zone. And I'm saying you, everyone should have three people, okay, three people in your support mechanisms uh, besides your, your immediate spouse so that if something happens to someone within the household, you have someone else you know you can call that will be there to, to assist you. <clears throat> um, besides that, uh, your, your plan should include uh, a lot of personal information. What I, uh, what I put together was a 10-page packet. In the packet, I talk about an identification sheet, and this is all your personal information so that uh, uh, your diagnosis, uh, you, your family members, your support group members, uh, your doctor, uh, all important information should be listed on a, on a, on a what they call, what I call an ID sheet and also a list of all your medications and uh, uh, you should also have a, a personal box for all your important documents so that in the event of uh, a moving you have everything all together so that uh, you can pick up uh, that fireproof uh, container and, uh, and, and move it out of there quickly. Uh, as I said, uh, transfer trauma is, is a huge thing, a uh, huge uh, stress mechanism that's going to be uh, uh, experienced by a lot of people. And some of the, what I wrote here, some of the emotional signs of this stress uh, are, uh, of course, depression, grief, irritability, identification with victims, feeling overwhelmed, you have, uh, you're confusing trivial items with major issues, difficulty to make decisions, memory loss, calculation difficulties, uh, reduced attention spans, concentration dif dif difficulties, etc. okay? And uh, you, you won't realize it at the time, but someone else will. And so it's good to have someone else uh, aware and be close enough so that uh, they can I identify these stre stress mechanisms that are going on with you. Uh, all told, uh, they say on average, uh, uh, transfer trauma is going to last about two years after the crisis. It's going to differ from person to person. But all total, about two years. Okay. Uh, this is these are the thoughts of someone uh, in, in a shelter or going through a crisis, especially the elderly. And, and basically, it's four thoughts that are going through their head. One, they're going to think they're going to die. 
Uh, two, they think they're going to be separated from their loved ones. Uh, three, they think they may be left alone. And four, they think the disaster is going to happen again. Okay, So you need to compensate for that by bonding with that individual. And that's why if you have developed a support group ahead of time, that person is going to be there to stroke that, that elderly person in a positive way so that uh, the, they'll be given the security and knowing that uh, they're going to get this through this thing and that they're going to be reori reoriented with their loved ones in, in the aftermath. Okay. And I experienced this, uh, as I said, in the 12 months after that, you know, I saw people uh, uh, losing their appetites and not sleeping at night. And, and this happened also during uh, uh, the uh, evacuation in a shelter. If you find yourself in a shelter and, and someone is not sleeping or their their loss of appetite, you know something is going on in their head. So, uh, so these are some of the things that uh, you know that, uh, is a concern for me. I think transfer trauma is probably the, the the key one. Okay. Now let's let's talk about some of the things you can do to make yourself ready now. Okay. And this day, I already said you need some kind of plan so that you can be proactive and know what you want to do. Know that uh, invariably cell phones probably are not going to work in a major crisis situation. So you're going to have difficulty communicating with the people you want to communicate with. And one of the best ways around that is to have a communication link outside the state of California, outside the California grid. So that, uh, you, let's say your siblings or your uh, uh, children uh, uh, will know that if, some, if you are in a crisis situation and they cannot get in touch with you, you can call someone out of state and say, I'm okay, I am evacuating to so-and-so location, they give the address, the phone number, etc., and uh, then the, uh, the immediate family or other people will know that if they can't get in touch with you, they can call out of state to this communication link uh, and uh, find out what's going on with you. And uh, so this is very important. I know some persons, uh, communication link is actually, this, this woman is foreign born and her communication link is outside the country. So, uh, so you need to develop this communication link so that uh, people who can't get a hold of you uh, can call this this number. And this this is true with families, uh, with children. You know, school. Uh, the s people in schools should should also know that uh, they'll have the list of all the parents, etc., and maybe an uh, immediate family member. But uh, it'd be also good to have an out-of-state communication link so that. Uh, the school could call this this line saying, "Well, the so and so is okay at the school. We're we're in a lockdown, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, shelter in place at this location or wh whatever." Okay. Uh, as far as household supplies, so much of uh, emergency planning is common sense. When I start my course, I always say, uh, you know, if you just keep your rationality and use common sense. Invariably, you're going to get through the crisis. Statistics show that most people survive the crisis. Okay, they do. You know, you have 50,000 people involved in a World Trade Center situation, and and you lost about 3,000 lives. Uh, percentages has statistically been in favor of the individual to survive. You, know, you don't want 3,000 people you know, dying, or as happened in I think 1970 in China with an earthquake in China where they lost. 250,000 people, and they may lose that now with the recent earthquake in China uh, when, when it's all said and done. Those are massive situations, but uh, as a rule, most people are going to survive the crisis. So just know that, okay? Uh, but you should just use common sense and put, put household supplies aside that uh, you can get to easily, you know, from blankets, sleeping bags, pillows, Portable radios. How many of you own a portable radio? You know, if the power goes down, uh, you need that battery-operated radio to get, you know, uh, the emergency radio to know what's going on. Okay. Uh, and another just common sense supply is uh, gasoline. You know, how many people wait till your gas tank is on empty before filling it? You should always uh, keep your gas tank half full. I mean, that's common sense. 
That happened to me, by the way. You know, I, you know, I'm, I'm guilty as anyone. The January 1st, 1997, my gas tank was empty. Okay, I evacuated on the third bus low. I said, told my brother-in-law, I said, just follow me in my car. And then I realized, oh, there's no gas in the car. So uh, uh, I had to siphon gas. I was able to siphon gas and because uh, the gas stations had shut down. When, once the electricity off, you can't, is off, you can't pump gas and you can't get money on an, out of an ATM. Because that's another common sense supply. So keep some petty cash supply at your house because uh, uh, you may have to go a long distance to access uh, money from an ATM or get gas because uh, the power is off. Okay? So, you know, use common sense to get the, uh, the things you need to get you through the night. Okay? You know, I, I, I talk about 10 portable toilets. Uh, cooler frozen gel gel packs cots you know I talked about this lady you know with a the government canvas cot that the American Red Cross uses one of my goals and uh, through uh, the facility coalition and the, and the primacy foundation I hope to raise or get money earn income so that I can buy these acute care cots it's like a hospital bed it's, it's 18 inches off the ground, it folds to 8 inches, uh, weighs 17 and a half pounds. It will uh, uh, allow someone three to 400 pounds to sleep on it, and it raises at the foot and at the, at the head of the bed, so someone with breathing problems or choking problems or edema is going to be able to be elevated, but they don't exist. They don't exist because, you know, they're costly, okay? And right now, as we know, statewide, you know, we're not running out of surplus. So I'm not looking uh, for, you know, the state to be purchasing this type of acute care cot, but they're, they're desperately needed. And I know a few areas in California has them. I know one county is slowly getting an inventory of them. I know in Florida, uh, I became friends with the uh, after the floods of 97, I started calling everybody all over the United States. And so I uh, became friends with the gentleman who wrote the state emergency plan for the elderly in the state of Florida. And after Hurricane Andrew, he saw this need for the elderly have to have appropriate cot. Okay? So uh, this West Cot was developed, and that does all that I told you. So, so one of my goals is eventually to get an inventory of these in counties uh, uh, starting locally, you know, say, uh, throughout the state. And that's, that's going to happen over a long period of time. So we have to do better, okay? Uh, so other household supplies. Uh, you know, regarding food, uh, in Y2K, and, you know, you had all these survival companies out there selling all this freeze-dried this and that. But, you know, just use your head. A little bit of ingenuity. You can buy canned goods, uh, different canned goods and, and uh, power bars and powder discs, and, and you should be able to develop a pretty good supply of uh, food that's not expensive and that you can use so that uh, uh, at the end of uh, a period where this might expire, you can just incorporate it into your daily uh, you know, eating system and use it and then replace it and it won't be out of, out of pocket, whereas I don't think you want to you want to eat survival food at your evening meal. Uh, so, and eventually all that exhausts itself. Uh, during the Y2K situation, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, uh, this, this woman, uh, uh, she bought, she was, fear needle say took over this person, and she bought cases of water. I mean, her garage was filled with cases of gallon jugs of water. And I went in her garage about six months afterwards. Of course, nothing happened with Y2K. Uh, but everybody was so worried, and they were buying everything, all kinds of camping equipment at that time, as we know. Uh, but I went in the garage, and uh, I lifted up one of these crates, these wooden crates that had several gallons of, of water, and it was light as a feather. Okay, so what does that tell you? There wasn't any water in, uh, in these, uh, these gallon jugs. And it was drinking water. And know that this type of water does not stand up over time. It will leach out, the, the, it will crack, uh, etc. Plus, the taste of the water will change because it will absorb the, the now that we know, toxic elements within the plastic. 
and so it's it's not a good way to go. So I re recommend uh, you know uh, that you use uh, I think it's polypropylene heavy uh, heavy uh, uh, plastic or or glass to hold your water. My parents have a 50 gallon water barrel in their garage, and you know, it's supposed to be replaced every six months. Water that you store should be replaced every six months. You keep it in a in a area out of the sunlight in a cool spot, but you need to replace that every three to six months. Uh, and uh, you know, there are other ways. Uh, there are these gravity-fed water filters that are always good to you know change polluted water into drinking water. One of the uh, items. Uh, that I have coming right now, I have developed a relationship with a company in in uh, Orange County that has developed a air to water generator, and you don't know it, but there's two to three quadrillion gallons of water in the air. So in in the next ten years, you're not going to be getting water out of the ground. We're going to be taking water from the air as a source of our water. And they say the water from the air is going to be a lot purer than the water from the ground having to go through all the contaminants that we put put in the ground. And this is the purest water you ever drank in your life. And so I'm getting these generators. So uh, they produce, uh, well, in Florida or in an area where it had has high humidity, it will produce 10 to 12 gallons a day. An area like this is going to produce uh, right around 3 gallons a day. But that's water that's going to be readily available for you in the event that the uh, water is cut off. Okay, And so... Uh, the water is, you know, you don't want to stop drinking the water. It's so good. So uh, my goal is for the licensed facilities to uh, uh, have these water generators in their facilities because water for the elderly is one of the key supplies. You know, you're going to survive days without food, but how long are you going to survive without water? Now, there was loss of life uh, when those people left Houston on that bus where, where they they. Uh, the the bus stopped along the highway and uh, people died because of dehydration. They didn't bring enough water with them. Okay, so water is one of the most important emergency supplies you can have. The emergency services said you're supposed to uh, save about uh, a three days supply of water, and uh, they use one gallon of water per day per individual as a guideline. So figure out how many people in your household and how much water you you should have. But now, because of the change of major disasters over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, they sort of uh, backed off on the 72-hour guideline and say, you know, your guidelines should be to survive maybe a week to 10 days, okay? A week to 10 days, or five to 10 days. Uh, so don't don't use don't take the short end, take the long end. I had emergency service director, I think, in Napa. Uh, uh, up there in Northern California, tell me, just tell tell your people that we may not get to you today and we may not get to you tomorrow, but we'll get to you. So what does that tell you? It tells you you're going to be on your own, okay? Uh, at the end of the year here, we're going to, the state, uh, various counties in the state of California is going to have a major exercise where we're going to have a uh, so-called hurricane in the seven range. I forget seven point something, seven point nine range. It was a major earthquake, and and they're going to test how it impacts. It's going to be out on the desert, I think, out in the Palm Springs area, and they've done the geological studies and seeing how this will impact uh, the whole area. And it's not good. It's not good. You think how many ambulances or or rescue units there are in in this area here? Okay, there aren't that many when you put the number of those emergency ambulances to the population. So if you have, you know, a thousand, ten thousand, nine one one calls going on at the same time saying I need help right away, know that they're going to do the best they can, but it may be not as timely as you anticipate. Okay, so that means you're going to be on your own. So we get back to the planning again. Okay. Are you equipped to meet your needs? Not only your household needs, but maybe uh, you have to do some uh, medical assistance. You may need to do some first aid. How many of you have ever taken a first aid course? Okay. And you know, it, it's not that expensive, and that knowledge is invaluable. 
Even that manual is invaluable. How many have you know, first aid information at home? Those that have, uh, have purchased first aid kits, how many of you actually open the first aid kit to see what's inside it? You know? They sell first aid kits at various denominations, and those lower denomination kits don't have a lot in it. I remember you know, buying the one for the facility and for 48 people, and, and I thought, you know, I spent a fair amount of money for this first aid kit, and, and then I opened it up. I said, oh, my goodness, you know, we're in, in, in difficulty here in a major situation. So you can supplement your first aid kit once you see what's there with uh, uh, whatever you feel is important, okay? Okay. I talked about water because I, I think it's so important. And uh, uh, you need to store it, okay? Uh, the important documents that I talked about before are such things as insurance policies, deeds, birth certificates, marriage license, death certificates, passports, bond certificates, stock certificates, receipts, pictures, of your furnishings to uh, substantiate your insurance claims, okay? I don't know uh, how many of you have earthquake insurance right now in your home. I know there's a high deductible, but then when you read in the newspaper, there's also a high probability of an earthquake happening in the next 30 years, over 90% probability of a major, major earthquake happening in the next 30 years here in this area. And so, uh, I think there's roughly about 9% of the homes have earthquake insurance right now. So it's not really that good. But uh, even though you have earthquake insurance, how many of you have taken the time to go room to room to room to room to take pictures or just inventory? You know, what's, what the contents are to substantiate claims. And you'll say that information needs to be also kept in your, uh, in your fireproof uh, uh, container that you would take with you when you evacuate uh, your your house. Okay. Uh, I talked about water. Uh, you know the importance of water and how water can be contaminated. But uh, what happens when water is shut off? Okay, and that's when you know the water that you stored is going to serve a good purpose. Another real important purpose of water is toiletry, okay? How do you flush a water without water? Uh, a flush a toilet without water. Uh, you know, you get one. You get one chance, and if your crisis goes into days, what do you do, okay? So you have to have a plan for that. You know, they, they sell expensive portable toilets. They sell... Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's a gel that you can put, you know, to it's a powder that you can put to create gel, uh, the waste into a gel that can be disposed of, or you can buy 33 gallon garbage bags and line your toilets, and after each use, you know, you uh, uh, take it out and reline your toilet. You know, that actually saved me one time. I had uh, one of my residents in my care home uh, uh, shoved a wash rag down the toilet and went into the sewer line and plugged up the sewer line so I had 25 toilets overflowing. So I told everybody, sorry, you can't use your toilet. You know, So we are in a crisis situation, especially with elderly. You know they use the toilet. So uh, I had to put that plan into effect. And, you know, and I was at an exercise in Los Angeles County and I mentioned this and you know, the moderator laughed. You know, it's, it's humorous, but it saved me for those few hours. Uh, so you need a plan to cover, you know, that situation as well. Okay. You realize that an elderly person is probably going to be in two places. Uh, they're going to be at home uh, or probably in their car. Uh, someone who is working, of course, that's the the other. Uh, area of concern. So your, your emergency plan should cover you at home. What do you do when you're at home? And also, what do you do if you find yourself in a car? And you say your car should also have some sundry items to get you through, okay? Which we get back to the water, the clothing, a sleeping bag, blanket, uh, 
first aid kit, all your common sense things you should also have in your car. Uh, I uh, I was in a uh, situation where I was teaching a class in uh, in uh, downtown Los Angeles in a high rise, okay, and. Uh, uh, we had an evacuation drill right in the middle of the class, okay? And uh, everybody in the class followed the person in front of them. Everybody went to the stairwell next to the elevator. And uh, they would say it was slow going because everybody went to the same spot, okay? So you have to understand when you go into any area, you need to know your, your way of getting out, your exits. Whenever you're in... Uh, a complex like this, you need to know your exits. Uh, if you're at home, you need to know your exits at w exits as well. Okay. So what I encourage you to do is to go from room to room in your house and say, if if we had an earthquake in this room, you know, what would I do? Or if there's if I had to get out quickly, you know, what are my alternative routes of getting out? Okay. And so that everyone in your family knows what to do, and there should be a relocation spot outside your home away from trees and away from power lines that everybody would, would tend to meet, okay? And if there is a fire situation, you should know more than one route from your home to a major highway, okay? In case the main route that that uh, you would want to go on is, is blocked. As these people going to the same stairwell when there were two other stairwells close by that they could have used, okay? And then everybody stood right next to the building once they were outside, blocking fire trucks if it was a real situation from entering and also if there was an explosive situation then you know needless say they would have been harmed so you want to move yourself out of a danger area as quickly as possible if you get the order to do so and maybe it could be reversed maybe uh, you get the order to uh, stay where where you're at because of toxic fumes in the area that's happened a few different times in the last couple of years where you chlorine trucks overflowing and what do you do in that situation uh, there there was a situation where uh, uh, someone uh, got a little bit ruly at a uh, football game and so this person was pepper sprayed and so the pepper spray uh, you say filtered down from the stands onto the playing field and you saw NFL football players getting off their bench and what did that tell you it said you know Sometimes fumes, toxic fumes, will seek its lowest location. So you say you wouldn't be evacuating to the basement if someone said there are toxic fumes in the neighborhood and you try to seal off your house, but the fumes got in your house and it's sought its lowest location. So there are little things you could do that, you know, or should do that would save your lives. Uh, last week we had a retired professional baseball player in South America got uh, hit by lightning. Okay, and killed. Okay, you know, it's just one individual, but that individual could have been you. So what we have had a lot of thunderstorms here, even in uh, Southern California recently, where we had hail and and a tornado in Southern California, and we we see this a lot in the Midwest. So if you're in your bathtub and uh, taking a nice leisurely bath, and over the radio they said you know you have a major storm in the area. You know, would you stay in your bathtub, okay? Or if you're talking to your friend on the telephone, are you going to continue your conversation? Because there are people that have lost their lives because the home got hit by lightning and it followed through the pipes and the wires of the home to the individual. So little things you can do that, you know, will, will save your life, okay? You can see that, you know, I ramble. And, uh, you know, I'm really, I think I'm pretty good uh, when, uh, you know, people ask me questions. So if you have any questions, uh, you know, feel free to ask them of me. Uh, power outages, the two key things are uh, power outages and, uh, you know, uh, water shortages or contaminated water that you uh, will incur more on a more frequent basis. And one of the ways of uh, checking your ability to uh, cope with a power outage is to maybe go home on a Friday night and don't tell your family what you're going to do and just pull the circuit breaker on the house, okay? And see what happens. 
you know, see if all chaos breaks loose when nothing works. See how you are you are going to react to that. Okay, and uh, you'd be amazed. Uh, you say, well, geez, uh, uh, I should have had this, or you know, I need the flashlight. And when you go to your flashlight, your flashlight doesn't work. This happened to me. I was out on Highway 99 going to Sacramento and had a blowout. Uh, in the middle of the night, reached for my flashlight, and the flashlight didn't work. Okay, so what did it tell me? I had the wrong supply. And I don't know if any of you have heard of light emitting diodes, LED flashlights, that the filament will last 100,000 hours. It's going to last your lifetime. I have one that has four D cell batteries that I only changed recently after five years because I left it on for eight hours. The, the lifespan of a battery is about 20 to 30 times longer than a regular flashlight. They last forever, okay? So how many of you have LED flashlights, okay? Everybody should have, have that kind of flashlight versus a regular flashlight. Or, you know, I recently bought a power supply, so that in the event of a power, power light, I don't have a generator, but I just have a power supply that will keep me going for a while. Light sticks are another one. Uh, but you need to be able to maintain, you know, your some semblance of normal living as long as possible. If you find yourself in a situation that is over an extended period of time, uh, we live in an area that uh, maybe you're not going to be able to evacuate. I tell the people in Los Angeles, you look at the traffic in L.A. right now. It's it's rush hour, 24 hours a day. So what happens if there's you know, we have this mandatory evacuation call, and uh, we want you out. It's going to be days before you're going to get out. So what is that telling you? Uh, it's going to tell you that you're going to have to shelter in place. You know, this this uh, drill that uh, these counties are going to be doing at the end of the year, what the geological survey showed that uh, Highway 15 and Highway 10 are going to close down okay, because of the earthquake. And Highway 5, which goes over the hill, uh, there could be landslides that could close that, but there's also a gas pipeline that goes from the coast, I, I don't know if it's Long Beach or wherever, all the way up over the top there, and you know, potential explosion there. So even Highway 5 may be closed. So how are you going to get out? Probably are not going to get out, which means uh, the county is going to have to bring resources to the people to keep them alive because the people are not going to be able to get out. So what have you done uh, for yourselves to uh, be able to shelter in place uh, because you uh, you can't evacuate? Okay, in a I'm talking major catastrophic situations now, okay? And I'm going to be doing a, an analysis on that uh, in an earthquake situation. City of Ojai, okay, uh, has... Uh, a lot of elderly in the area. They have homes in the area. And it's interesting, there are two access roads to Ojai through Santa Paula and then up uh, through Oakview. If in a major earthquake situation, if those roads shut down, being that the uh, staff to the facilities in Ojai, Ojai commute, they're not going to be able to get to their place of employment. So who's going to provide the care and supervision of these people if, if staff cannot get to them? Okay? Or if if you're uh, getting your delivery of ox oxygen from a town maybe 20 miles away, and they're not going to be able to get to you. So a lot of things, a lot of intangibles surface. You know, speaking about oxygen, elderly, elderly person on oxygen, uh, same way with the gas tank. You wait till your last uh, oxygen tank before you order your, your refills, right? I mean, that's a common way. Wait till you're out, and then you reorder. Well, that's wrong. You should be reordering when you're about you have half the normal number of tanks, and that's when you reorder. So that in the event of a crisis, you have those uh, portable tanks to keep you alive when the power goes off, because your your concentrator is run on electricity, and if you don't have that, you're going to rely on those portable tanks to keep you alive. Okay. Uh, little things like you know, we lost about a thousand dollars worth of our food stuff in the freezers uh, because of that. Uh, if you know where they sell uh, uh, dry ice, you, know, you can put dry ice in a freezer and keep 
things going for a long period of time. Uh, in earthquake, you know, it's the standard drop, cover, and hold. Okay, uh, you should be moving to interior walls. Uh, yeah, we've only lost uh, about 160 people in the last 15, 20 years in California. Uh, I said we, but we've sustained over 31 billion dollars worth of earthquake damage here in California, and uh, there's there's two types of quakes. One, the north. The Loma Prieta quake leave the uh, the the plates shifted horizontally, but the Northridge earthquake, the, the plates down this area are going to shift. This is where you get extensive damage. I was about 10 miles from the epicenter of the Silmar quake when the hospital went down. Okay, and so major damage there. So we're in an area where you know if if there's a major shift of the plates, there's going to be major damage. You know. Even in the Northridge earthquake, you know, they found cracks in the welds of these buildings. So what does that tell you? Okay, in a 7.9 earthquake, what's that going to do to buildings? You're going to have buildings come down. Okay, so it's going to be a concern. Yes. And I, I have a question um, in reference to seniors and seniors that are disabled and have special needs and that. Yes. What types of programs are, or are, are there any programs and services that are doing any kind of outreach where they can, let's say a senior that is confined to, at home and limited and maybe doesn't have the the uh, resources in terms of family or friends that are close by because they're shut-ins. Yes. Is there an outreach program or service that the P these people can connect with that if there is an emergency that would have them on a list, a call list of some sort? Yeah, it's, it's a catch-22 situation. It's a dilemma that uh, county governments uh, struggle with. I know Ventura County uh, is working on uh, their own in, uh, their own in-house list, but uh, you have what they call HIPAA requirements, yeah. where you have confidentiality, yeah. and you don't want all your personal information out uh, on the internet for anyone to access, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it rises the possibility of uh, abuse. So mm -hmm. you try to you know. There's just a major struggle going on where you see the need to identify people who need support so they're going to be in their house and no one's going to come to their aid. Right. Uh, and so someone has to get them and get them out. Okay? And once they're out, someone's going to have to take care of them when they're out. Mm -hmm. So you need to identify those. You know, it, right. It's a question of senior can centers. It be, can it be done through uh, the fire departments or... Any of no, those it won't be the fire department. Or, yeah. um, the Department of Social Services, the Area Agency on Aging. You know, these county government, mm -hmm. uh, county agencies are are struggling with this right now to uh, accommodate this need because it is a really important need, mm -hmm. and that's why it's so good for the uh, elder community, maybe through your community outreach, to identify these people and then develop the individual support teams for these people to, to come. Uh, it's, it's so much easier if, uh, if we knew what was on the other side of the door. So if someone was in a wheelchair, someone was on oxygen, right. someone was, uh, had Alzheimer's or was combative or uh, multiple sclerosis or uh, spinal bifida. I mean, I mean, some of these are, are major situations. Well, some some of that though, Ed, um, is uh, you know, there's organizations such as like Meals and Wheels and that that might have a list. But I right. just wondered if there was any hub that yeah. was being developed that would coordinate all these services. Yeah. And yeah, people yeah. that are ox. I mean, we you, you, we talk about water, but people that are on oxygen, if they can't breathe, and then there's no electricity, and they may have a backup system for a certain amount of time, but then what happens right. from there? Yeah. Well, you have uh, in-home supportive services, IHSS. You have a lot of caseworkers going out throughout the county, you know, into the homes, mm -hmm. taking care of these people. Okay, and it's just a question, you know, of accessing you know the the information on this properly and legally right okay. some of those people are going to be taking care of their own emergency needs too oh yeah uh, you know oh, yeah so. and then you have the caseworkers through the regional centers that work with the developmentally disabled mm -hmm. okay 
and so that's one of the one of the concepts where this this project we're working on is to develop these teams so that when these people end up in a shelter because they don't have another place to go that their needs can be properly met hopefully at the shelter and if it's too acute then to go higher and, and someone who is being taken care an elderly person who is being taken care of at home uh, and they're acute and they you know that they're not going to do well in the shelter what's to prevent you from going to your doctor and saying okay uh, in the event of a crisis uh, I'm not going to make it if I go to a shelter. And will you give me a standing order allowing me to uh, evacuate or to go into a skilled nursing facility, okay, in the event of a crisis, or an assisted living facility maybe, okay? Uh, it takes a doctor's order to do that. So if you had a standing order for that, you would know the doctor agrees that, you know, you're not going to make it in a shelter. You need 24-hour care, and you already have the order to... For, for admission, okay? Uh, you know, what happened during the... So are you suggesting that, that, L yeah. that senior... Yeah, if they're that? acute. What happened during yeah. the floods of 97, a lot of these people were the home health nurses were going into the homes. Mm -hmm. uh, the spouses were bringing their loved ones to the local hospital. And what was the hospital doing? They were overwhelmed, okay? Right. And they were saying, I'm sorry, you know, the emergency room was, you know, over capacity. We cannot meet your needs. You have to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, a, a, a simple little follow-up to that. Uh, is there any prioritizing going on with emergency responders in terms of who they go see first? Or let's say such a vulnerability list existed and it was uh, available to those who do respond. Is Do you know how they prioritize where they go and when they go? Well, I know uh, in Ventura County, uh, when they get a call into the emergency operations center, they will be able to know what type of vehicle is closest to meet the needs of that call. Uh, the fire department, uh, and in fact, the county knows where all the licensed facilities are and most likely has been inside all of those facilities. But as far as individuals, uh, it would be on a call-by-call -call basis. Um, we've enjoyed your talk. It's been very, very informative. And I would ask um, if you could summarize the important points of your talk uh, just so that they would be more clear to all of us. Well, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, uh, we see that, you know, I, I, I get emotionally involved in doing what I'm doing. Uh, you really don't understand the impact of this until you go through a crisis. Once you through a crisis situation where you have evacuated, you had to shelter, you're not going to be the same person, okay? So for me to tell you, a lot of this is out of sight, out of mind, and in six months from today, you forgot everything I say. The most important thing I can tell you is to keep this in the front part of your brain and periodically go back and say, what if? You know, what happens if uh, we get this call today? Am I going to be ready? And don't put it out of sight, out of mind. You know, just keep emergency planning in the forefront so that you have alternatives. And if you have a support team, talk to them frequently so that you know the support team still exists. And do the basics of, you know, having an adequate supply of water and getting all your personal records together so you can get it. Uh, having you know, some basic items, your glasses, your shoes, things close, flashlight close to your bed. So if there's an earthquake and you're elderly and you don't get around very much, you know the important things are going to be close by that you can use to you know, save yourself and, and get yourself into a more protective situation. Uh, but it's a continuing process, and, and uh, uh, I have, uh, you can contact me. I, uh, you know, I have the Facility 911 Coalition, and I can be reached uh, if you want me to give an email. Uh, it's uh, www.facility911.com, okay? www.facility911.com. Uh, uh, you know, I have this. It's going to be a lifelong, uh, uh, you know, job here to, you know, just do something positive and change people's lives. I also have a corporation called Discover Living Inc. that's going to change people's lives. So 
this this is my life, and you know. Uh, so if if you have some needs, then you know, feel free to contact me, and I'll do my best to lead you in the right direction. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, we we enjoyed your talk, and we may be calling upon you in future date to come back and give us an update. Okay, happy Thank to you. do so. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, getting back to our regular program, um, we had a wonderful talk by Ed Lupton about uh, disaster preparedness, and um, I think it was great. And like I said, we, we would like to invite him back sometime in the future for an update. And I'd like to, uh, on programs and public information, and during the past term, Programs Committee has done a great job in providing speakers with, with hands-on knowledge of the various subjects of interest to seniors. We will be continuing to bring speakers to this program to report on these issues that affect seniors. Uh, information about these programs will be provided as it becomes available. And uh, moving on to uh, our next subject would be outreach, and I'll call on Mel. Thank you, Harry. Last week, the uh, Senior Adult Master Plan and Needs Assessment Project, uh, otherwise known as SAMP, uh, reached a very important milestone. The uh, Council on Aging had a, an organization meeting breakfast of the, of the advisory committee to move into the next phase of the project. Over the past six months, uh, the project has been evaluating uh, what we've been doing and uh, looking for what direction and, next step and the next steps that were needed. Uh, in the meantime, we have been collecting surveys and visiting senior venues and events. Uh, we reached a point at the breakfast where we knew we were ready to, uh, to move ahead, and uh, the meeting was a huge success. The committee members were energized and excited about the work that we have ahead. The composition of the committee committees were very uh, impressive uh, with a large number of outstanding leaders from the community the meeting clearly exceeded our ex expectations the meeting was attended by 40 people which included 34 members who are on the advisory committee many new members have joined the committee uh, on that day and uh, all are committed to working in conjunction with the council on aging to develop a draft SAMP by June 2009, a year from today, from now. The advisory committee was organized into seven focus groups corresponding to each of the topical areas in the baby boomer and senior surveys. Well over 2,000 surveys have been received and about two-thirds have been tabulated and given to the advisory committee. The collection of surveys closed on May 31st. Each focus group will have a leader, a, a Council on Aging facilitator, and will individually meet on their own at agreed upon times and locations. The focus groups were given a project timeline of key target dates and a convenient template layout for collecting survey results uh, and recommendations and to help prepare for a community meeting somewhere in the October 2008 time frame. So one of our important goals was to empower the advisory committee to function in this way where they individually as group in groups go off on their own uh, with our guidance and periodically get together and work towards uh, towards the specific uh, targets and goals so uh, I think to the to the council to myself this was a major major step forward because uh, in fact now the advisory committee uh, is very uh, enthused and excited about moving into this phase and uh, basically uh, we have uh, we have passed the project on to this impressive group of people who will together work with us 
to reach our goal, final goal, and product. Uh, so uh, at this point, I'm going to invite my fellow commissioners to supplement my remarks. But before I do that, I want to thank the members of the commission for all of their effort in helping us to reach this milestone. People of the outreach committee uh, who have been who have been introduced before, and others all pitched in. In fact, now if we now take the various uh, facilitators from the Council on Aging, they will. Uh, uh, we, this will involve you know, practically all of the all of the council members, and that's and to, and that's also significant progress. But uh, I, my remarks wouldn't be complete without special thanks to City Liaison Francine Spriggle for her dedicated support above and beyond the call of duty, and I don't say that lightly. Uh, that otherwise translates into evenings, uh, night, and, and uh, weekends. Uh, I don't know how she does it. She also accomplished this in the, in the face of a uh, number of challenges over the last few months, uh, some personal and uh, others, uh, and, and the fact that she uh, also uh, was a valedictorian at her graduation at Cal Lutheran University. Here. And delivered a uh, an excellent uh, valedictory uh, address, and so uh, Francine, you uh, are. Uh, we can fly higher than an eagle, but you are the wind beneath our wings. Thank you. Uh, would you like to few words? Anyone? Yeah, I would like to uh, to say amen. Amen. When I was in church, um, I attended the um, breakfast meeting, not as a member of the committee, but as a member of the commission, and it was a very good meeting as far as I was concerned. I saw it with a group of volunteers, and they were very enthused about it. So I guess we are getting our message across. Anybody else have any com comments on this uh, on this breakfast? If not, um, we'll now move on to our annual celebration of the Senior of the Year and Susan Poprock. Thank you, Harry. Um, well, tomorrow is the big day, uh, June 5th, uh, 5.30 at the Global uh, Senior Adult Center, and we hope that you all will come. There are still tickets available. Um, we would like to give special thanks to the Ventura County Star for publishing uh, in yesterday's newspaper information about the event. And um, if those, if you haven't read that yet, um, we'll have wonderful entertainment by the band that you're all um, used to dancing to, the Unforgettables, but also by Susan Cashman, uh, Miss Senior California, and her sizzling seniors will also perform. Um, Time Warner, of course, and TOTV will be there, and um, uh, we're going to have wonderful food this year um, again. Uh, Buca de Beppo is providing macaroni rosa and their home-baked bread for dinner, so uh, for a $4 suggested donation, um, get your tickets and come down and have some fun. We'd also like to um, thank very much the um, different sponsors, people who have allowed us to uh, provide different gifts and for the um, gift drawings. Uh, Armstrong Garden Center, the Brain Longevity Center, Buca de Beppo, Claim Jumpers, Firestone on Thousand Oaks Boulevard, Help Unlimited, Home Instead Senior Care, the Hornblower Group, IHOP, in and out JW Molding, Canner Corporation, Man Theaters, Mastro's Steakhouse, McDonald's of Thousand Oaks, The Norkins, Photography by Forest, Sports Chalet, The Thousand Oaks Civic Arts Plaza Foundation, Trader Joe's, Virgil's Auto Body, and The Vitamin Shop. So um, it's going to be a wonderful evening and the, the purpose again is uh, to to thank and to recognize um, the people who have been nominated for this award for their dedicated commitment to the seniors of the community and um, 
This year's final nominees for Senior of the Year are Sylvia Atkins, Bill Blakely, Marge Campanier, Porter Ellis, and Sally Kutcher. So please come down and, and uh, join with us in thanking them for their service and in honoring this year's Senior, which will be announced tomorrow evening. Where else could you get dinner and dancing to a big band for four dollars? So if you haven't bought your tickets, please buy them at the Global Center because that's where the tickets are right now. Um, moving on to our next uh, committee, it would be legislation, and I guess that would be Martin. Thanks, Harry. Uh, reverse mortgages, officially known as home equity conversion mortgages, are designed to provide seniors with access to the equity they have built up in their homes. However, aggressive marketing of these loans caused some seniors to make poor choices. The hearings held last year by the U.S. Senate Special Committee on Aging resulted in legislation to help seniors make better decisions. In April, an amendment was added to the Foreclosure Prevention Act of 2008, an act which is still in progress. It would allow the Department of Housing and Urban Development to fund independent counseling and disclosure activities for federally insured reverse mortgages. It would prohibit mortgage sales agents from serving as counselors. It would repeal a provision in the existing law that offers incentives to purchase long-term care insurance along with a reverse mortgage. It actually would prohibit any requirement to purchase insurance or investment products as a condition of taking out a federally insured reverse mortgage. It would require that loan originators be HUD certified and require that councils meet qualification standards and follow established protocols, and it requires a study to determine if further protections are needed and for the suitability of reverse mortgages for consumers. Thank you, Martin. Um, that's a very interesting subject. I think we should need get more coverage on it in the future. Um, you also have fraud. Uh, do you have anything on fraud today? There's always something. <laughs> well, a little over two years ago, we reported about predatory lenders and brokers who would talk seniors into refinancing their mortgages. The reason they gave was to enable seniors to turn the equity they had accumulated in their home into cash to pay expenses or take a vacation or buy a car or some other reason. The real reason was for the broker to earn the commissions and fees charged for the refinancing. Six months or a year later, the value of the home had increased and the broker would talk the senior into another refinance, earning him another commission. This part was totally legal, but some of these brokers were scammers. They kept pushing these mortgages until the owner could no longer keep up with the payments and they could seize the house. We did not know it then, but we now know that when homeowners, as these home values stopped increasing and interest rates went up, we ended up with today's financial crisis. Well, refinancing, refinancing today is hard to get, but the scammers are not discouraged. They found new ways to make money. First, find the homeowners who are in default and offer to help them avoid foreclosure. One way is to offer to negotiate with the lender. You pay the scammer whatever you can, and they will pay your mortgage for you, only they don't. They keep your money, and you end up in foreclosure anyhow. My favorite is they ask you to sign a quick claim deed over to them, and they will take over your mortgage. You pay them whatever you can afford, and they pay your mortgage for you for a while. But when they find a buyer for your house, you will be evicted because you no longer own the house. You're just a renter. If you are having trouble making your mortgage payment, talk to your lender, the mortgage company. They will do whatever they can to help you. They don't want to foreclose on your house except at a last resort. Avoid the stranger who offers to help. Deal with people you know and can trust. Thank you, Harry. Uh, we held our last meeting of the VC AAA in Simi Valley, so we had a traveling show, uh, which was very effective and were treated very nicely. 
Uh, Mel, do you have any notes or anything from from the meeting that you would like to? I, I can't recall any particular highlights above and beyond our normal duties. Well, I think uh, a number of uh, there are a number of interesting reports from uh, some of the committees now that the. Uh, uh, advisory Council has uh, been organized into, uh, into into committees, and uh, there was uh, one one report in particular that uh, the outreach committee of the uh, area agency, which is trying to do the same thing that our commission is doing, is to try to reach more uh, people in uh, more seniors in the uh, in the community, uh, have gone through a. Uh, an extensive change in their brochure, and uh, this brochure uh, it, it took quite a few months to put together, and it's going to be the basis for uh, moving out into other uh, communities uh, for a uh, for that uh, to, to help uh, uh, get the name of uh, the area agency out on the uh, into the community. Um, I'd like to jump in for a moment here. Um, I understand that from the last meeting of the AAA, it is desirable that this commission appoint two of its members as delegates to AAA, and uh, in so doing, I'd like to move that uh, this commission appoint Mel Silverberg and Jim Searden as their delegates to the AAA. Do I hear a second? A second. Tom second. Is there any discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion is carried. You are now both the delegates to the AAA from this commission. Thank you. One of the things that's kind of interesting with some of their committees is they're doing a, a pretty darn good job of trying to reach out to the boomers. They've held a couple of... Uh, of uh, social situations where the wine and cheese kind of things where they've invited boomers into the into their community and uh, again uh, they're sort of following some of our our paths in the sense that we uh, in our outreach effort have managed to to get a lot of information that we didn't necessarily expect to get from our survey and a lot of that was done online but I guess the important part of that comment period is that the, the VC AAA is, is doing on a countywide basis, or at least making an attempt, to do what we're doing here in, in, in Thousand Oaks, and that's to get a better feel for what the needs are, going, are now and what the needs are going to be in the future for seniors. So uh, I, I'm very, very excited about the VC AAA's new approach to... Uh, to their meetings in the committee structure because a lot more actual work is getting done and we're looking into you know what the heck we're going to do with all the needs and services with all the budgets being cut so a lot of a lot of good stuff going on there any any other comments about bc triple a mel I, I just <clears throat> wanted to add uh, i think those are good comments i just wanted to add that the uh the vc triple a uh, given the uh the era that we're entering entering into in the in terms of uh, budget shortfalls and uh, service reduction and so forth, is now uh, actively uh, developing, going to be developing a program within the council to uh, get more involved in advocacy, in advocacy to you know local representatives and advocacy around the around the county. And I think uh, what I would envision is that as time goes on, uh, probably a lot better. Uh, cooperation among all of the triple A's in the in the state, if they could, to strengthen uh, this advocacy program because uh, I think uh, it's the old story about the uh, the squeaking wheel. So, uh, uh, and of course, we may run out of oil to uh, to uh, <laughs> to lubricate the wheel. But uh, if we instead of oil, we can use our voices. Thank you, Mel. So our next report is on the RSVP, the Retired Senior Volunteer Program. Okay. Well, every year, RSV helps people who are eligible for the Homeowners and Renters Assistance Program. Uh, they will file application for you if you are eligible at the Global Senior Adult Center, 
on Thursdays from June 26th through August 28th at 9 a.m. to 12 noon. To, you may be eligible for a refund on your rent or mortgage. To qualify, you must meet the following, have met the following criteria by December 31st of last year. You had to be 62 years of age or older, blind or disabled. You had to have lived in your own home or, or qualified for a rented uh, residence in California. If renting, you paid at least $50 out of pocket per month for that rent. Uh, you had a total household income of approximately $42,000 or less, including all your Social Security. If you feel you're eligible, you should bring with you your federal income tax return, your Social Security benefit statement, the SSA 1099. If you're a renter, bring your landlord's name, address, and phone number. If you're a homeowner, bring, a cop, bring your county property tax bill. Everyone must bring at least one of the following proof of age, a driver's license, birth certificate, baptismal certificate, or a passport, or your acceptance letter from Social Security. And if you did not file last year and you feel you were eligible, come on June 26th and they will file for both years, last year and this year. The deadline for filing for a previous year is June 30th, so make sure you come in on the 26th. And this is a free service. It's sponsored by RSVP volunteers. There is no charge. Okay. Thank you, Martin. And now, uh, Andre, is there anything at all going on at the Global Center? No, not at all. That's why my whole June newsletter is so full that the, the, the print got smaller and smaller to where we can hardly read it. Um, today we started a new walking program take a walk and we're probably going to change it to take a walk in the park uh, because we're meeting behind the global senior adult center and we have actually measured the distance around the park behind us so we go past the library and around and so we have two routes and they're measured out so we started that this morning so that's going to be every wednesday um, at 8 30 at the global senior adult center You've already talked about the Senior of the Year Award, so myself and the rest of the staff will be extremely busy tomorrow. Uh, but besides that taking place tomorrow, we have um, a guest speaker seminar on whole mind success. Um, this will be uh, presented by speaker Bala Kanyansen, um, who's creator of the Whole Mind Success. And so it's, it's looking at a way to be creative, productive, innovative, unlocking those sections of your mind um, and techniques and about if you're left-brained or right-brained. Um, that's why some people are more creative than others or more, more statistical depending on which side of the brain you happen to use a little more of. So anyway, it's kind of interesting. So that'll be taking place tomorrow evening as well. So we're going to be, we're going to be really busy tomorrow. Uh, we started a beginning bridge class, which is free and that's on Wednesdays from 1230 to 130. And Irma Cackert's going to be back uh, this month on the 12th, so next week on Thursday. And she will be talking about India and bringing some of her artifacts and her slides. And then anybody else who has traveled near there or in through there, she always welcomes everybody sharing their stories. Uh, so that will be 1.30 to 3. And then on June 16th, which is Monday, so just a couple more weeks away, uh, we're doing lunch with the staff. So we are going to barbecue at the Global Senior Adult Center, and it's $4. And so you can get hamburgers and hot dogs and potato salad and chips and drinks. There's going to be some entertainment and some prizes. So um, we're also going to do a Jeopardy game, and it's all going to be about the staff. So if you think you know us, maybe you'll play Jeopardy with us and win some prizes. Um, and also just some in questions and concerns, anything else anybody has. So it's going to be kind of a fun thing. Um, you know, we all have our travel. We all have the travel program um, with Global Senior Adult Center, day trips, long trips. And actually there will be um, an upcoming slideshow and information about some trips we're going to be doing, which will be Christmas on the Danube, China, and Africa. So if anybody's interested in doing some really long and some fantastic trips, um, our representative will be there on Tuesday, June 17th, and go over that information and slideshows and talk about the trips. 
We also seem to be on a health healthy run here. Um, besides starting our walking program, we're going to have a program, Savor Your Health. And that is being presented by Safeway and United Healthcare. So they will be coming on Tuesday, June 17th from 9 to 1. And they're going to be talking about managing your prescriptions and uh, Medicare 08 education. And uh, you'll also get to have uh, free blood pressure screenings that day as well. And we are taking reservations, so we make sure we've got enough space. Uh, so at the end, I'll give you our phone number. Water and exercise, swimming, we start that up on um, June 18th. So every summer we do a free exercise swim program. We utilize um, Thousand Oaks High School pool on Mondays and Wednesdays and Newberry Park High School pool on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 1230 to 130, and it's free. So you can come exercise with staff, or if you want, you can swim on your own laps because we have a few people who do that as well. Um, then on the 25th, we are doing Healthy Aging, and uh, that will be presented with, um, by Dr. Sharon Norling, who was here the other week. So um, she'll be talking about diet and exercise, and she's actually coming through with the Mind, Body, Spirit Center, so they'll, they're kind of presenting her as doing uh, the program. And that will be from 1230 to 130, so Wednesday, June 25th. That one we are going to be taking reservations for as well. And last but not least, since it'll be right around the corner before you know it, um, July 4th, there's a whole variety of things taking place through Caneo Recreation and Park District between pancake breakfasts and home run derbies. There's actually two of them. Our sports department does one, and we do one as well. And ours will be at 9 a.m. at Borchard Community Center on Field 1, and it's for anybody age 50 and up, male or female. And it's only going to be $4, and that includes trophies and just some real light refreshments because it's, it's fun, and there's uh, ribbons and whatnot going on, too, besides trophies. So it's a good, fun program to do. And um, Safety and Wellness Day, which the city is, is doing uh, June 11th at the Civic Arts Plaza Park Courtyard area, which will be here. There's going to be a whole bunch of different vendors coming um, here and screenings and Canal Recreation Park District will have a booth but what's interesting is that we're able to have a shuttle bus with two pickup times from the Global Senior Adult Center so we will actually be able to shuttle a total of 70 people over here and back so then you don't have to worry about parking so that's just a free first come first serve sign up list at the Global Senior Adult Center. Uh, so that will be happening Wednesday, June 11th. The whole thing itself is from 12 to 2. So we'll be having the shuttles leave at 12 and 12.30, and then everybody will end up being back at the Global Senior Adult Center between 1.30 and 2. So it will give both groups a little bit of time. Um, and I know we're not meeting in July, so anybody who's listening might want to write down a date. I will have Lifeline screening coming through July 19th at the Global Senior Adult Center. So people can go and get low-cost stroke screening, um, your arterial fibrillation screening, your um, abdominal aortic, and your peripheral artery disease. You can do one or all four. Um, it definitely costs less than trying to go through your doctor or pay for it yourself. So, And that has its own specific number. So if anybody's interested in this, um, it's an 800 number, so that would be 1-800-324-1851 for the Lifeline screenings in July. But any of our other programs that I listed that we need just seating reservations for or anybody who needs more information, call the Global Senior Adult Center at 381-2744. Oh, last but not least, summer concerts in the park, and they're free. And those are at Caneo um, Center over off of Dover and Hendricks. So the first one will be Memorial Day, so that's coming up May 26th. Uh, and that will be the Harry Selvin Big Band. Then, of course, there's always the July 4th um, with Canal Pops. The other one will be Sunday, July 13th. It's a Latin World Fusion type band. And then August 10th, California Dreamin'. So musical journey through our Golden State. And last but not least, the Labor Day concert. And that will be a Motown review with the best intentions. So there's lots of things going on this summer and things at the Global Senior Adult Center. And there will be a whole bunch of new programs coming up this fall. So um, um, make sure you watch your newsletters and your um, recreation guides coming in the mail.
Andrea, Any questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, Andrea, uh, uh, did you mention the fact that the b shuttle bus to Woodland Hills Kaiser comes now from the Global Center rather than from Senior Concerns? Yes, the Kaiser bus is now meeting at Global Senior Adult Center on their their days that they do shuttle down to Kaiser and to the shopping area and back up. Um, I don't have that particular number with me because it's not in our newsletter and it's not ingrained in my head yet. Um, however, you could call um, just Senior Concerns itself to get the phone number for the, the shuttle. So that's really nice. Ah, never mind. I do have the phone number. We we we, we mistaken. Um, so if you want to take the shuttle, that would be 805-341-8004. And so it does, I know it does runs Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Those are the three days. Yes. Question. Um, you mentioned some very uh, interesting, exciting travel programs, including the one to Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, my basic, <laughs> not, not, not yet, but uh, my basic question is, uh, is there some way that people are screened? Because, you know, there may be some folks that might not take, a trip like that very well is there some kind of a waiver or uh, how, how do you that, that people qualify or doctors note or something how, how does the group that's all up to you you're all oh, adults so in other words <laughs> <laughs> I don't screen you whatever you think so, you can do and you can get your inoculations and you can walk and travel then you take the trip okay. and if you have the funds to pay for it yeah, so there is a I assume there's a travel there's a travel group that's doing this for the Golden yes Center. we have a we have a, a company that do, does does okay. that for us yes okay. Thank and you. so they present all the documentation all the information that you need and it's your choice and uh, to decide if that's something you can do or not do. Thank you, Andrea. There's so much going on at the Global Center, and it's getting to be crowded so badly that I don't know how, how you accommodate all the classes and all the things that you do there, but I know they try very hard. Well, most of our new classes that we are adding are in the late afternoons and evenings, so hopefully everybody that likes to do different things or who might still be working or working part-time, you'll be able to find some new and different things to do there. Uh, plus, we will have some exciting upgrades to the building and the grounds itself over the next four or five months. So um, that'll be fun to come and see. I don't want to mention it now. I don't want to jinx anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Um, do we have any old business for the commission? Uh, no old business? How about any new business? Okay. Um, and before we adjourn, do, do, are there any commissioner comments? Yeah, I have a comment. I want to thank everybody for going out and voting yesterday. I think that was a real good turnout, and I um, just wanted to make sure that we thanked voters for getting out and doing their share. Also, I wanted to thank our speaker uh, personally today, and I wanted to add one little uh, comment, which I didn't get a chance to add earlier, and that is on fireproof containers. It's probably wise to have two of those in two different locations. Uh, the fires that went through the Arrowhead fire this past year uh, traveled at 70 miles per hour, and they cooked at around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, people who had automobiles, uh, they were totally melted, e even on down to the wheels, which were all steel wheels melted right to the ground. So it is real important to have two locations where you store all of your important documents, and hopefully if you have an opportunity to put pictures on um, the high-tech uh, discs these days, that would really be the way to do it because then you have two locations to uh, really put very great amount of information in a very small place and last but not least it's very important to get around and take both individual pictures and if you have anybody that has a camera that uh, has moving uh, quality to it uh, to take a moving picture and you want to face every single wall as well as every ceiling and every floor in your home and comment about what's in there. In addition you want to open up every single drawer and every door even to a pantry and take photos of all of those items. Insurance companies will ask for every detail on down to what pen and pencil you might have had stored 
in that desk drawer, what you paid for it, when you bought it, and what the replacement cost is. It's a phenomenal, traumatic exercise to go through following a huge loss, which is a trauma in itself. So it's a double whammy. But if you're prepared, as our speaker has told us today to be, you're in much better shape. Thanks. Thank you, John. Jim? Yeah, I have one little announcement. I, I was called out of this meeting earlier uh, with a phone call, and it was to inform me that I'm a new grandpa again for the 14th time, I might add. Oh, wow. Congratulations. So, uh, Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy and pleased. Thank you. Um, I, I uh, Harry? Yes, please. Um, just to add a little bit to the last, uh, uh, to our last commissioner, be sure to, when you're, when you're, uh, taking your photographs to, uh, be sure to mention the date that you're doing all this too, or show a date when you're taking your photographs. One other, uh, uh, comment of information that I would like to share is, uh, in reference to the food share program that's, um, having some difficulties at this point because of the lack of donations that are coming to food share. But, um, it is out there for people who really need to have some help with, with food. And, uh, but one of the issues that they're trying to make real clear is that some of our people qualify for food stamps that should be applying for food stamps. And, um, that is a way of getting some additional help. So I want to give you the number of the food stamp program, which is, uh, 584 4842. That's 805 584. 4842. So if you're a low income senior and, um, you know, you're in need of some a little additional help, especially with the cost of food today, you may qualify for the food stamp program. Or also the food share program is 483 7 100. And they do a brown bag. Uh, once a day, once a day for people who are in need of basic supplies, and then of course we do have Mana, who is uh, four nine seven, four nine five nine, and they also will supply Mana will supply emergency food for people who need it. And I just want you to to share with you. I hope you have a very healthy and happy. Summer filled with some of the wonderful programs and exercises that the Global Center uh, provide. Thank you, Tony. Um, and I have a few comments I wish to make. Uh, first off, since the vacation time is coming up and a lot of people are going away, the Thousand Oaks Volunteers and Police have a program called Vacation Home Check that if you call them at 805 449 Two seven four zero. They will come and check your residence about twice a day while you're away to make sure that uh, that, that your home and contents are safe. And um, I'd also like to say that Friday commemorates the 65th anniversary of D-Day. I use the word commemorate and not celebrate, for on that day, so many American, British soldiers, and others perished in gaining a toehold on the beaches of France. Despite the terrible loss of life, they were able to hang on and advance until Germany surrendered on May 8th of that year. I know it well because I was there. We commemorate this day and all the brave men who gave up their lives so that we may live ours as we see fit. Also, this is the last meeting of the current season for this Council on Aging. We hope our broadcasts have piqued your interest in this commission and that you have become faithful viewers of our broadcasts. There will be a workshop meeting on August 20th, 20th when this commission, along with new members appointed by City Council, will be seated. Thank you all for watching and have a great summer. And I adjourn the meeting now at 244.